So turn to Acts 13, if you would. Today is uh, day one of the World Cup. Who's excited about the World Cup? Five or six of you. This is, this is miserable, you guys. Um, so, you know, the World Cup happens every how many years? Four. It is the biggest sporting event in the world. And uh, I don't think it has uh, undergone such scrutiny and condemnation and criticism as it has this time around. Does anyone know why the, 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 the criticisms are, uh, are surrounding this World Cup? Anybody? So bribery? Is that not a good thing? I'm just Okay. Bribery? What else? Corruption. Location. Human rights violations. Uh, there was a period between June and August, 44 people died, one a day, one right after the other, in building these arenas and these stadiums. But you would think this past week, the issue of all issues happened, and you guys heard maybe what it was a couple days ago. They have outlawed or prohibited the sale of beer at the events. I know. Lord, take me now, because I cannot live in a world without Budweiser. Actually, I could. I could. So two days ago, they announced. So Budweiser had reached a $75 million agreement to be the beer seller at the events, and basically the government said, we're prohibiting all sale of alcohol. So the Twitterverse, because that's where all living happens, and just side note, Jesus got his Twitter account reinstated, and Donald Trump did too. So all is good. Elon's doing a great job. So um, they prohibited. So now the Twitter verse is saying, don't let the pro prohibition of the sale of alcohol distract us from the more important topics. And isn't it easy to get distracted from things? What's more important, beer or countries that live by corruption and bribery? <laughs> What's more important, beer or the lives of migrant workers who have given their lives and died, and there's been no attention given to that? Ladies and gentlemen, while we may be talking about Qatar or the World Cup, here's the thing we have to realize is that the enemy loves to distract us from focusing on the things that are super important, and we get wrapped up in the trivial, don't we? We get, we get all, you know, we, we think ultimately life at the end of the day is about who, your political candidate either getting into office or not getting into office. And I'm going to tell you, while that may be important, there's something more important. This is what we're going to talk about today. Your hearts. Now, some of you are like, oh, no, this is not the day to go to church. <laughs> You're going to talk about my heart? So we're going to allow God to take a peek at our hearts today. Because here's what I know about my heart. According to Jeremiah, my heart is the deceitful instrument. It's, it's able to tell me things that are not true. It, it encourages me to live in a, a realm that's not reality. Because when I'm confronted with truth, it makes me see things about my life that I'm so quick to move on from. And there's one thing I know that God is more concerned about than anything else, and that is the condition of your hearts this morning. So we get to do an examination of not just your heart, but my heart. And, and maybe at the end of this, the Holy Spirit will have shown up and brought something to the surface, either maybe to comfort you or maybe to convict you. But whether it be comfort or conviction, here's what I know about God's grace, is that His grace is able to minister to us according to the need of the moment. Because His goal is to make you more like Jesus. And so we welcome the good, we welcome the bad. We're going to use Acts 13 as our jump off point, so turn there in your Bibles if you would. We're going to finish out the chapter. Finally, this is like our fifth message in Acts 13. And uh, what a good way to kind of close this section before Paul and Barnabas move on to other locations in chapter 14. So Acts 13, turn there in your Bibles if you would. Lord, we invite you to examine our hearts today. We, we invite you to, to turn over the... The, the soil to reveal things about you, to reveal things about us, and may the end, may we be a changed people for the glory of God and for the glory of Jesus Christ and for the work of the Spirit. Amen, church? Acts 13, verse 42. So Paul just got done 
delivering an amazing message on justification by faith alone in Christ alone. <laughs> That's really, last week we looked at two verses, 38, 39. Uh, and then verse 42, check this out, what, what, how God is going to use the word to, to, to change this culture. And as Paul and Barnabas, verse 42, chapter 13 of, of Acts, were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and, of the, and many of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. That would be quite a scene, wouldn't it? And when the Jews saw the crowds... They were filled with compassion. No, that's Jesus. This is someone else. They were filled with jealousy and began to contradict the things spoken by Paul. So they're just, they're just, they're just rebelling against this message. And not just that, but they're blaspheming as well. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly against them. Got to love his bulldogmatic ways, right? Paul says, it is necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you First, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Whoa, that's, that's serious. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. <laughs> We're going to go to someone who appreciates our message, right? And then he quotes Isaiah 49, which again, is something that they're very familiar with. For thus says the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you should bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying God, right? There's the, there's the shouts of jealousy, and then there's the shouts of joy. And they start rejoicing, they start glorifying God, the word of God, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was begun, had begun to spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews aroused the devout women of prominence. When you get the ladies involved, look out, right? And they start leading the men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts this morning. So five things, uh, five conditions of the heart. Uh, we're going to allow the Spirit to work. The first is this, we see at the outset of this section, there's a hungry heart. Notice verse 42, verse 43. Paul, Barnabas, they share a word with the, 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 the synagogue, the people gathered. There's no altar call. There's no like, hey, hit me up. Here's my, here's my Instagram account. Here's my email. They just simply pack up their stuff, and the people were clamoring for more. They, they, they followed them and said, will you come back and preach that same message next week? Now, as a pastor, I've never had that happen. I've never had someone like say to me, that was so good. Can you repeat that message next week? I'd be like, yeah, this gives me a week not to prepare a message. What should I go do? Go golf? Go hang out? Go to Sedona? I don't know. Right? I've never had this happen to me. And not only that, here's a little bit of a creep factor. They followed them and were begging them, right? So it's kind of like, please, 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 please come back. Please come share with us what you shared with us today. We want to hear it again. These people were hungry for the word of God. Because here's the thing. God wants to create in us an appetite for God's word. And he doesn't want us to be satisfied with anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, the word of God appears four times in this section. Verse 44, 46, 48, 49. And I'm going to encourage us to, to, to pray for God to Make us heart, our hearts hungry for his word. They can't get enough of it. They're not satisfied with just an hour-long sermon. They want more. How's your heart doing today? How's your heart doing when it comes to the hunger for the word of God? Because here's what I do know. Every day you've got an in insatiable thirst, insatiable hunger. My guess is majority of you are filling that hunger with stuff that doesn't matter in time or eternity. Can I get an amen from somebody? You and I are, we're fed a whole bunch. And let me just tell you, the world is ready for a banquet that looks really tantalizing and, and scrumptious. And you and I dig into it. And in the end, we go, yeah, it was good for a couple minutes, but I'm still a little hungry. 
Because nothing in this world was designed to satisfy you apart from God's word. How's your heart today? Does a hunger for Jesus? Does a hunger for God? Does a hunger for the Spirit? Does a hunger for the, the Scriptures? Do you want more? Are you good by saying, I'm good on Sunday and the rest of the week I'll just do whatever I want and I'll come back and get, get the refill next week? There's something to be said about a hungry heart. See, these people hungered for the message of, of Jesus because they were involved in a culture where their religion and their philosophies were empty. It didn't satisfy, it didn't satisfy them. They, they ate they participated, and they still came up short because you and I were not designed to feast off the things of the world. You and I were designed to feast off the living God of the universe. That's why Jesus says, I'm the bread. Let's come down from heaven. Eat and find that there's no end to what I provide. This is why Jesus says, I'm the water. That's like a spring, and drink all you want. It will never, ever cease. See, that's what we want. Just like John 4, the woman at the well, Right? She was tired of being scrutinized by her world. She was tired of condemning her own heart. And she comes to the wellspring of wellsprings, and that is Jesus. Where are you doing? Where are you at today? Do you hunger for God's word? Do you, do you always want to, you know, go to church with this desire that I want to hear from God's word and that I want that to set me on, on fire for, for feasting on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday? Because, ladies and gentlemen, apart from the word of God, there's nothing given to us that pertains to life and godliness. What are we to think if we neglect God's word? I didn't mention this first service. I'll mention it to you guys, but I'll mention it later on. Like perhaps you're thinking about next year, 2023. And I'm going to encourage you, get into the word. Make it a, a year where you say, I'm going to read through the Bible. 90% of Christians have never read, riven, read uh, they've never read cover to cover. 90%. Get a, I will provide you all the reading plans you want. My prayer is you get into the Word, and you don't have to wait till 2023. Amen? Amen? You can do it today. Lord, create in me a heart that wants you, that craves you, that desires you, that, that hungers for truth and righteousness. Did not Jesus say this at the very start of his ministry? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is satisfying your hearts today? Are you clamoring to get into God's word? Or are you clamoring to pick up your, your, your smartphone and see what's, what's, what's going on in the Twitterverse? Are you clamoring to see what's going on? Oh, what show am I missing on binge watching right now? I can't, I still talk to people who are like, yep, I watched all 53 episodes of this show over a period of four days, didn't get any sleep, just had a constant source of Mountain Dew and, and coffee coming into my system. And then, you know, they look like it too. They're like, the show was awesome. And I'm like, hey, did you give a nod to Jesus at any time during this marathon of yours? Like, may God create a desire for him in our heart. Do you, do you hunger for him? Because here's the thing. I think this is evidence of, of people who are disciples. Let's, let's talk about this because it's, it's interesting because Paul and Barnabas turned to this hungry crowd and they encouraged them to continue in the grace of God. Notice verse 43. To continue means they've started. There's the good news, right? Like some of them are in with Jesus. They're saved but I also want to encourage you the important principle of continuing in grace with Christ. See, there's grace to enter. We all, we all agree you have to start, right? You have to enter that relationship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 for you, right? By grace we've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, right? You, you are given this gift, of faith to believe by God. He has welcomed you into his family. There's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus, right? Thank you for that reminder, Paula, right? We are, we are now his workmanship. Thank you, Beth, for that, that reminder today, right? And so we are now in, but you also have to realize that just because you have grace to enter, so many times we forget there's grace to continue, right? You need to continue in this intimate relationship with God because there's always a temptation to go back to our old ways, there's always a temptation to embrace our, our old selves. And here's what I know. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old's gone, the new has come. Hallelujah. 
The two, first two verses ever given to me as a young believer in Christ, 15 years old, someone said, you need to memorize scripture. Praise God for those men and women who said, memorize the word, memorize the word. The first two verses had to do with identity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, behold, he is a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. Second verse, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. This is so important. This is so important, right? There's a temptation to go back to your old ways. There's a, there's a temptation, especially when difficulties arrive. When you sign up to follow Jesus, sometimes it doesn't get easier. It gets harder. Can get, someone testify to that? And it is quick to say, well, why am I doing this? I thought Jesus was to make my life better. I'm going to tell you right now, he does make it better, but sometimes he still has some rough edges he needs to file off your life. That's called discipleship. And this grace to continue is so important because Paul would write these, this theme back to this church in Galatia in the letter of Galatians because Galatians was this letter saying, don't go back to the law. Don't go back to your old works. Don't go thinking about it's your performance. It's, it's grace to begin, it's grace to continue, and it's grace that's going to carry us home. Write these verses down in your notes. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse, verses 2 and 3. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, enter, are you now being perfected by the flesh? No grace. No, 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 no. Don't forget about the grace to continue. He later on in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, says these words. He says, you were running well, right? You entered the race, you're running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? I feel like this is my call as a pastor when we get together on Sundays for our, our corporate time together to say, keep running the race and keep obeying the truth and keep hungering for God. Right? Because all I know is there's a temptation to look, go back to who you used to be. You are no longer that person in Christ Jesus. You're a new creature in him. And I'm going to tell you right now, how do you, how do you tell a real disciple from a false one? The real disciple continues. Jesus put it this way. Abide in me. John 15. The real disciple, disciple abides. The real disciple endures. The real disciple says, there's nowhere else I can go that has the words of eternal life but Christ. How does this hit you? Do you, do you hunger for him? Because this, this, if the spirit is present, he will bring to remembrance all the things that Christ has said to bring comfort, to bring conviction, and everything in between. But that's the presence of God in your life. If you're a real disciple, you want to continue in grace. You want to endure with God's strength. You want to abide because the intimacy that you have with Jesus, nothing in this world compares to it. How does this hit you today? Because I'll tell you what. Some people may not be enthusiastic. My number one fan, knocking on the door. They're just, they're just clamoring to get in, aren't they? <laughs> Look at her. Okay, point number two. Not everyone is enthusiastic about Jesus. There are people that have hardened hearts. Matter of fact, I even, as I'm even speaking about a hunger, some of you are like this. It, it doesn't hit you. Because we are, we need to be real and we need to be truthful and say, not everyone who sits in this room knows Jesus. And that's okay. I'm glad you're here. But there are people that don't respond favorably. Look at what happens. Verse 44. So the next Sabbath, <laughs> they go back, right? Same message. Oh, every pastor's dream, right? Like, preach that same message again. It was so amazing, right? Um. The crowds have gathered because they've never heard the word of God like this. 
But some people weren't happy, and that's the Jews. Look at what that says, right? And the Jews that were there were filled with jealousy, which then led them to rebel against what was being taught, and then they started blaspheming Paul. Sadly, those who are most familiar with God's word can sometimes be antagonistic. No, look, at, look at what happens here, and there's really a, a, a pattern and progression that I want to I tease out a little bit with you, but... What's the thing that bothers them most? They're jealous. What are they jealous for? Because they're going to synagogue, and they get there, and the synagogue is full, and someone's in their seat that belongs to them. <laughs> um, some of you who maybe have Baptist upbringings can relate with this point. Uh, I'm not saying it's Baptist exclusive, but I'm ordained Baptist minister. I got some training in a Baptist church. I know how people guard those pews with their lives. And if someone is in their seat, oh, Lord, hell hath no fury. Some of you are laughing. You're like, you know. You know. So they come to the synagogue, and instead of rejoicing that unclean Gentiles are hearing the message of truth, they're mad because someone's sitting in their seat. I've seen this happen. My heart has, has grieved over the fact that these men and women who are priding themselves in their seat have no rejoicing over a fact there's a person there who has a lost soul who gets to hear the name of Jesus proclaimed. What makes your heart jealous? Because jealousy, jealousy reflects a lot. Of, of what's going on inside. These men are jealous, and they're, re, and they're basically fleshing out this principle uh, of what fills you controls you. You ever heard that? Write that down. What fills you controls you. These men are not filled with the spirit. They're not spirit controlled. They're filled with jealousy, and it impacts their behavior. And, and what's the progression here? Three blanks in your notes. There's jealousy, there's obstinacy, and then there is blasphemy. See, jealousy is the heart. Jealousy and envy, perhaps two signs of the same coin. I love what Frederick Beekner said. I don't know if you're familiar with an author named, I talk about Lewis, I talk about Spurgeon. We got through a little Beekner in there, who actually just died a few months ago. Amazing writer. He has two books that really, Hungry and Dark, Magnificent Defeat, check it out, Beekner. He said this about envy, and I love this definition. He said, envy is that consuming desire to have everybody else as unsuccessful as you are. And there it is. These Jews realize the law is failing them in gaining eternal life. See, when you're confronted with grace in the gospel and you don't have the law and your works to stand on, you feel like I've spent my whole life doing something and now you're saying it doesn't matter and doesn't count. So these men are going... Why should I rejoice over these Gentiles? We're failing in our spiritual lives. We want them to fail with us. And so jealousy, which is in the heart, leads to obstinacy where they're rejecting the message. They're rebelling against what Paul is saying. And it is a terrifying place to be to fall into the hands of a living God who's trying to get your attention about accepting him and instead you're rejecting him which then leads to blasphemy, which is nothing other than a manner of speech that disregards or disrespects the value of another person. So instead of a, a, addressing the argument, they attack the messengers. This is how jealousy erupts in a human heart. You realize you don't have a leg to stand on, so you start attacking the person. And this is not going to end well. This is, not good. this is not a good situation, right? They're not interested in what, what Paul and Barnabas have to say. All they can do is spread lies. I had this happen one time, not at the Baptist church, just so, just so you know. We're going to be good. We're going to be nice to the Baptists. But in the first church we planted, we had a leader who disagreed with something I was teaching literally at the moment, and he's walking the hallways telling people that I'm spreading lies. And I'm not being word-centered. And one of my other leaders overhears this and confronts him in the hallway during the service. And says, what, what are you doing? 
And so there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. And so I, that night I go home, like, what, what do we need to do? And like, I need to just ask this guy to leave. So the next morning, right, before I reach out to this guy, he calls me and says, can I have an appointment with you? I said, yeah. He says, we're leaving. And part of me was like, good riddance. I didn't say that out loud. I just, it was in that imaginary bubble above my head, right? But I was like, don't let the door hit you on the way out. You know, you ever say that to some people, like, don't go with God, just go? It's okay. You can say those kind of things. But I'll tell you what, even within the church, you know, there are people that will oppose the message of Jesus. There are people who come in, they're just wolves in sheep's clothing. Right? Paul and Barnabas, they're dealing with this. This, this blasphemy, right? Here's the good news, right? The God who's given us his word can, can move beyond the rejection of the message, can, can move it about beyond the opposition to the message, because God's word will do what his word does. It will change people. But some people may not accept. They may reject. And so Paul, he stands with this group, and he says to them, a sharp rebuke. What are you guys doing? This is the message given to you by God. This is the message given to your ancestors, your forefathers, Abraham, Moses, David. And you have been reticent to share it with others. Look at the rebuke. Look at verse 40, 45. And Paul says, it is necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Remember, this is, falls in line with Romans chapter 1, right? He says, we know that the, word, the, word of God, the power of God is the word of God, and it's, we're going to give it to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. Why? Because you repudiate it and, and what? Judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. That's a haunting phrase. And then he quotes Isaiah, which is the same passage that Simeon in Luke 2 shares in the temple when he holds the baby Jesus. Because here's the message of Isaiah. The gospel is for all nations. The gospel is for all people. The gospel is not just for this little group. It's for everybody. Amen? And what Paul says to this group, he says, Instead of being the privileged announcers of this message, you become the pouty adversaries of it. You like the little twist on words there? Write that down. You in Christ, me in Christ, we get to be the privileged announcers of the gospel. But sometimes because of jealousy, we become the pouty adversaries of it. You want to know how you remedy jealousy in the heart? Rejoice over what God is doing, even if it doesn't involve you. I don't care who the pastor is. I don't care who the church is. If people are coming to know Jesus, rejoice. And rejoicing over what God is doing, even if it doesn't involve you, will kill jealousy in your heart. It's that moment you just start criticizing and condemning and whatever, right? Even Paul in Philippians chapter 1 said, I, I may not agree with your methods of getting people to Christ, but people are getting to Christ, and that I can rejoice in. That's how you kill jealousy. Weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, and praise God for the faithfulness of workers doing work that may not look like the work you're doing, but at least they're doing the work. What about you? With Dr. Susian on you right there. <laughs> who are you to judge what God's doing. So if you go to Paris, there's a famous museum in Paris called the Louvre. And in that museum is a famous painting by da Vinci called the, which I hear is like that tiny? No, <laughs> a little bit bigger. That's the number one complaint I hear. It's like, we just thought it was bigger. It's not. But say we go to the Louvre and we go see da, da Vinci's masterpiece or one of his masterpieces, the Mona Lisa, and say you look at that, that painting and you sit there and go, you know what, it's really a lousy piece of art. I have the right to turn to you and say, my friend, the Mona Lisa is not on trial. You are. It's already been judged to be a work of art. It just reveals you're a lousy critic. Right? You hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? You guys know the Ninth, Ode to Joy? Da, 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 right? Who are you to come along and say, yeah, it's a pretty crummy piece of, piece of music? 
it has already been judged to be a masterpiece. What that reveals is that you are a lousy appreciator of music. Why am I saying this? Jesus isn't on trial anymore. Jesus has already been declared to be who he is. You're the one now on trial. How do you see Christ? Because what you do to and what you do with Jesus Christ, you either declare judgment upon yourself or you announce freedom because of who Christ is and what he's done. It's a pretty eye-opening truth, isn't it? It's a mind-blowing truth. It's a heart-condemning truth. But not all are going to respond favorably to the gospel. But some will. Point number three, a hearing heart. Here's the good news, right? Is that not everyone is blaspheming. There's not just shouts of jealousy. There's shouts of joy. Look at what happens in, in verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God, right? They're sitting there going, we're excited. I don't know what those bozos are thinking over there, right? They're jealous. We're joyful. And look what happens, and I love this. Look at the end of verse 38, uh, 48. And the word of God, uh, they're rejoicing at the word of God, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. God is emphatically trying to get our attention here that while some hearing is, is clogged and blocked, some hearing is made attentive to, to what God wants, and they are made alive. See, we look at this, and we have to understand something. That not all who hear truly hear. Did not Jesus say, I'm saying this for those who have ears to hear and, and eyes to see. See, we have to realize we live in a world where people are born into this world spiritually deaf. They're born into this world spiritually blind. They're born into this world spiritually dead. They have hearts of stone, not hearts of flesh. And we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It is our nature. And what I love about the end of verse 48, and I don't want you to miss this, is that there's this beautiful picture of the sovereignty of God. Because here's what puts our minds at ease. This is what puts our souls at rest. This reminds us that there's a God who cares more about people than we do. Even though there is a part of human responsibility that works with God's sovereignty, here's the good news, is that God has appointed some to believe before you were even born. The Bible says, before the foundation of the world, God predestined some to life. Ephesians chapter 1. Revelation chapter 13 and 17 also echoes this, that before the foundation of the world, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. And we sit there and go, what? Some of you are hearing this for the first time. Some of you are maybe hearing it for the hundredth time. All I know is that's here, and God wants us to give our attention to it. Because here, Paul and Barnabas, they're not coming on the scene entertaining and doing magic tricks in order for them to get a hearing. They're not pr providing some new striking presentation. They're just declaring the Word of God, and the Word of God is doing what the Word of God does. It pierces the soul and is able to divide joint and marrow, soul and spirit, Hebrews chapter 5. Or what Isaiah says in Isaiah 55 verse 11. Check out this verse. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I have purposed and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word is powerful. You don't need to bring more power to it. You don't need to bring more strength, more wisdom to it. You let the word do what the word does because God has been doing this for eons. And he has an appointment with these believers in Acts 13. They are appointed to believe. The, the word appointed is what we call the divine passive. I'm going to get nerdy on you for just one moment. Divine passive says it is an event that happened in the past with continuing results to the present. The God who appointed, the God who elected, the God who predestined, the God who chose before anything was ever created is a God who's going to be sure to fulfill his will in saving those whom he chooses to save. 
My appointment was August 15th, 1985. Upstairs bedroom, house up in North Scottsdale, the Holy Spirit opened my heart, uh, uh, opened my heart applied the, the salvation that Christ accomplished for me some 2,000 year, years ago, and, and, and changed me into being a born-again son of the Most High through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That was my divine appointment. Do you remember yours? Do you remember that moment when God opened your eyes to see the beauty of Jesus? He opened your ears to hear the truth of Jesus? to soften your heart so you could respond to Jesus? Because is it, God must act before you respond. Because unfortunately, here's what the Bible says, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2. But God makes you alive in Christ, Ephesians 2 verse 5. Right? Jesus says this in John chapter 3 verse 20, that anyone who hears and rejects the gospel hates the light and does not come to light lest his deeds be exposed. See, we remain in darkness in our understanding because of the ignorance that exists in us and the hardness of hearts, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. You want me to go on? Okay, I will. We suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Perhaps Romans 8, verse 7 is probably one of the, the, the scariest. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't want God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot which just goes right in concert with Jesus chapter 6 of John where he says no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws them. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a God who is active today who opens the hearts of those who are unbelieving. Woohoo! Two of you rejoice. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for the rest of you. See, we have to understand that, that Acts is clear. We just talked about this in Acts chapter 11. May I remind you, refresher, Acts 11 verse 18. Look what it says. It says this, that Paul was taking the message. They heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Unless God grants, you do not get. That's it. And then later, we're going to meet a woman named Lydia, awesome, amazing businesswoman. She deals with purple, color of royalty. Acts 16, here's what it says. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. See, I told you. From the city of Thyatira, I don't lie. Seller of purple goods, see, truthful, right? Like, oh, we can trust Pastor Scott. Maybe. Hold your, hold your thoughts. Who was a worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. God does the opening. God does the awakening. God turns the heart of stone into the heart of flesh. Why? So that you cannot take the credit for anything. Let me remind you, it's God's appointment, first point, which is the divine side of evangelism. Whom he has chosen, he will save. But he will not do it without vehicles and messengers and announcements like, announcers like you and me. Here's the human side, is that there's humanity's acceptance. And it is a true choice. It is a true acceptance. But we are given the faith to believe in the, in the, in the end. The ultimate way in which you are saved is only because God has acted on your heart and intervened in your darkness to open your eyes to the beauty of Jesus. And once your eyes are open, you can't help but embrace him. It is a true choice. It doesn't come through some automation, some sort of mechanation. Uh, it is a true choice, but it is the choice to believe. And God merely passes over those he has not appointed to eternal life. No one goes to hell because God has destined them to go to hell. People go to hell because of their own rejection of Christ. And C.S. Lewis said that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. God has appointed, but we still get to be messengers. Amen? Amen? You get to be a privileged announcer. Have you tasted and seen how, 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 how good the Lord is? Tell others. 
Because Lord knows you're blabbing about that sushi restaurant you ate at the other day. If only we were as excited for Jesus as we were for about whatever restaurant, whatever show we're binge watching, whatever thing we saw on Twitter or whatever, if we were only excited about Jesus, boy, we truly understand that God uses human agency to bring about, to participate with his appointment with people who are being saved even as we speak. Wow. What a good reminder. That God is the one who renews us by the Spirit and creates faith in the heart so that we respond and that, that, that people believe and they're simply responding to the activity that God is already doing in them. And Jesus even confirms this with saying, in no way is one who's been entrusted to me is ever left out. My sheep hear my voice. And when they hear my voice, they follow me. There are some who don't belong to my fold. That's the reality of it. Not everybody is saved. And let me just say this. And I didn't say this first service. See, sometimes you guys are privy to little bits. I know that one of the number one responses I hear from people is, well, that's not fair. That God should appoint some to believe and others he merely passes over. We're quick to use that word fairness. And I will say, well, let's use fairness as a, as a, as a, as a standard. No, what's not fair is that God would choose to save anybody. See, some of you are like, good point, El Jefe, good point. See, we walk in this world with a sense of entitlement, like God owes us. God doesn't owe us anything. He would be perfectly just and righteous to condemn everybody to a Christless eternity. And the good news, can I be the privileged announcer once again? He doesn't. He chooses to save some. Are you kidding me? And if you are among the one or the many that's been appointed to believe. Rejoice in your salvation. Glory and revel in the mercy and grace of your God. And don't miss out on the fact that when you announce the good news, you may be participating with God and seeing others come into the fold that belongs to Christ. I once was blind, but now I, amazing grace, Amen? Wow. There are people who are falling short of what God expects, what God requires. Let me remind you of something, that without Jesus, we're all doomed. And good works aren't going to account for anything. The law is not going to account for anything. There's this ultra marathon runner. I know as soon as I say that, some of you are like, ooh, that hurts me who just this week, her name is Camille Heron, she ran 100 miles in world record time, 12 hours, 41 minutes, 11 seconds. 100 miles. I can barely run 100 feet without crying for my mommy. Well, she, she broke the world record, or so she, she thought she did. The track and field officials came out, and they actually remeasured the course and found that she was 716 feet short. And they took the world record, record title away from her. Can you imagine running almost 100 miles and falling short 716 feet? Here's the thing that, that I'm reminded of. All fall short of the glory of God. And unless you're perfect, it doesn't matter how good you are. You, you fall short. And this is why we rejoice in the fact that we have a substitute. One who stood in our place. One who has done the work that we were supposed to do but we could never do because of our hearts and our uh, uh, attitude and our rebellion. Our dis the list goes on. But Jesus came to stand in our place. It's what we call penal substitutionary atonement. He did what we could never do, perfectly righteous, and now all who are in him not only have our sins forgiven, right? We get his righteousness on our account. 
and all who are in Christ are now perfectly positioned and saved by his grace. How many of you can give me a little hallelujah right now? It's okay. I won't, I won't judge you as charismatic or something like that. If I go to the movie theater this week and I, and I want to go see a movie and the cost is $12, that's the price of admission, and I only have $11.74, they're not going to let me in because there's the price. And we don't give discounts. Here's, here's the thing we have to understand. No matter how good we may think we are, compared to Jesus, all of us fall short. That's why we need him as our advocate. We need him to stand in our place. And when you hear that, if you're saved in Christ, it delights your soul. It's a reminder that grace is what we need to enter. Grace is what we need to continue. Final two points and we're done. There's the hostile heart. Because, again, if you continue to bring a message to bear that people don't want to hear, that, that blasphemy turns to violence. It turns to aggression. Look what happens in verse 50, 51 here. So it says that, that once they're preaching, right, the word of God is being spread, right? God's doing a work because his, his word will never fail. His will will be accomplished, even in the midst of rejection and opposition. Verse 50, but the Jews aroused the devout women, we're going to call them the, uh, the Women's Liberation Front, along with their hubbies, decide we need to get rid of these guys, he instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. And what do Paul and Barnabas do? They had heard Jesus teach on this. If someone doesn't want me and they reject your message, just go ahead and wipe the dust off your feet and move along. Some of you are like, oh, that sounds unloving. That just lacks compassion. No, actually, there's wisdom there. There's wisdom there because here's what you need to understand. How many of you have a problem with spending too much time with a person that's never going to change? None of us can relate with that. But I'll just say hypothetically, if you're that person, sometimes we can really cast our pearls before swine. There are people in our midst that we, we have adopted as our personal spiritual project. And they are rejecting Christ. They're hardened to God. And I don't want this to sound insensitive. This is actually going to be, this is going to be helpful for you. You need to move on. That doesn't mean you still can't pray for them. But there are people you're going to meet who are either gospel softened or they're gospel hardened. You pursue those who are gospel softened. There are people in your life that want to talk about these things. We're going to call them pre-Christian. We're going to call them the men and women in your life that are open to discuss spiritual things. I'm going to tell you right now, pursue those relationships. But there's also going to be people who are gospel hardened, and you need to spend less time on them Pray for them, but move on and dust the feet, dust your feet. That doesn't mean God can't bring you around. That doesn't mean his word won't have that perfect work in their heart. They may call you and say, you know those discussions we were having two years ago? I'm a little more open to it. Okay, cool. In one moment. Because here's what you have to understand. The same sun that melts the wax is also the sun that hardens the clay. And you need to know that there's a time when you just need to cut bait and move on and pursue those relationships that are gospel softened. We rarely do this, but for Paula, we're going to make the exception. Hmm. Yeah, I will say just initial comment is there are people that have been hurt by the church. I, I'm one of them. I'm a poster child of peop someone who says, I'm the guy who should have never come back to the church. And yet I'm back because here's what I realized. The church is imperfect, but, but God is more than perfect, right? And 
God has to just help us lick our wounds and heal and stuff like that. So, uh, and we're notorious for shooting one another, right, while we're wounded and while we're down and while we're hurt. But here's the thing. If someone doesn't crave, and again, this is a spirit birth thing. If that person doesn't crave community, I'm going to tell you right now, that person is probably a, a person that doesn't have a heart connected to Christ. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If I, I, I may use Google. I hear something that happens in the Google organization I may not agree with. Am I going to be like, well, that guy made a mistake, so therefore I'm throwing it out, right? We, we understand grace, especially in the church, right? We're not talking about Google. We're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Here's the thing. God will create a hunger for the things that he's passionate about that he wants us to do, that he wants us to participate in. So what happens is some people are looking, this only adds to the disobedience that already resides in our hearts is that we're looking for excuses not to do the things. And we've made those things idols, whether it be hurt, whether it be resentment, whether it be hostility. And it's easy to kind of throw a screen on it and say, well, they hurt me, so I, I don't want to be a part of that. No, that's not an excuse. If the Spirit is in you, the Spirit is going to crave the things that are near and dear to the heart of God. And I would say that person needs to start making movement. Because if there's no movement, I'm, I'm going to say there's no Spirit. All that God has deemed to be saved will be saved and display or demonstrate some level of Spirit presence. And I don't even know if that answered your question. Uh, and maybe someone in this room needs to hear that this morning. Sometimes we believe in the organic nature of things, right? That everything's not scripted, but uh, is that a good word? Is that a good word? Okay. Um, so prayer for those who are gospel hardened and then pursuit of those who are gospel so softened. And I love this because it leads to our last point, and that is no matter how people respond, you can have a happy heart. Yay, we can leave on a good note. Pastor Scott talking about all this mean stuff and nasty stuff and whatever. Like, hey, you don't know the bad news. You can't know the good, how good the good news is until you understand how bad the bad news is. All <laughs> right? And notice in verse 52, and even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of rejection, even in the midst of being driven out of the district, even in the midst of, of being persecuted for your faith, here are men and women who are filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. First note is, notice that they're filled with the Holy Spirit and there's no speaking in tongues. Amen. Amen. Again, everyone's just like, like, I'm not against tongues, but I'm just against people saying, well, if you're going to be filled with the Spirit, it's going to make itself known in you speaking in tongues. Dun, 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 dun. Wrong. Not all speak in tongues, do they? First Corinthians chapters 12, 13, 14. Okay. Sorry, that's my little side tirade right there. Okay, here's the good news. If you're in Christ, whatever is going on circumstantially in your life doesn't mean joy cannot be included. Persecution and joy in the Scripture go hand in hand. Suffering and rejoicing actually work together in Christ. Some of you are like, okay, convince me. We need a little bit more Acts 5.41 in our diet. Oh, you got the verse up there. I didn't even give it. Douglas, give it up for Douglas. Like, so the, the apostles are beaten, and they're, set, they're basically beaten, and they're ready to kill them, and they release them, and they say, Hey, now that we've beaten you, hopefully you got our message. Don't leave here and tell people about Jesus ever again. You think that the apostles are going to abide by their rules? No. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Here, here's what I do know. Is that in life, not everything is going to work out the way you want it to work out. Here's what I know. When you talk about God, Jesus, the scriptures with somebody... Not everyone's going to be enthusiastic for that. And here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to have this little self-wallowing pity party. Oh, 
I, it's okay to be sad, but may that sadness be mingled with hope because Jesus says to his disciples, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you as well. And suffering and joy are actually great business partners together in our lives. We don't mourn as those who have no hope, Paul says. There is a suffering that reminds us that we're doing exactly what God wants us to do. My joy is not in the results. My joy is in who I am in Christ Jesus. Am I doing what he wants me to do? Amen? We suffer when we think the results are about what we can generate. We rejoice realizing we've been obedient, but we're going to let God do whatever he needs to do through our obedience. That's how we rejoice. Can I get a hallelujah from somebody? See, I want you to be unshaken. I want you to be unintimidated. I want you to be men and women full of grace and love and compassion. I want you to be the privileged announcers of what we're talking about, not the pouty adversaries of what's being talked about, because Jesus is what it is all about at the end of the day. How's your heart feel today? Have you been convicted by something? Have you been challenged by something? Have you been comforted by something? I pray that the word of God has done its perfect work in us and through us. And all God's people said, "Woo! let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for today. Thanks for the body, the church, this community. Lord, we, we get to talk about Jesus together. We get to experience the, the Spirit's presence. We get to open your word. We get to sing songs of declaration that hopefully ref reflect hearts that, are, that have been gripped by you and seized by you and captured by you. Thank you for calling us into your family. Thank you for taking away the sting of death the consequences of our sin. We have, a, we have a, a Savior who has borne those things upon Himself and we rejoice in the fact that grace has been shown to us. An appointment to believe has been given to us and that from time eternity past. We are now your kids in Christ and we rejoice in that. Thank you for loving us. May we be found faithful to follow you, to grow in our love for you, and to share the good news with every single person we may come in contact with. Thanks again for today. Thanks again for this community. And thanks for the ways you work in and through us. For your glory and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And by the power of the Spirit. Pray these things. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to shine his face upon you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.